I did some work at King's College in London. So I've kind of been all away, all in different countries, living in these countries um, as a visiting professor as well. Um, and I've, done, I've, I've lectured at George Mason, University of Maryland College Park, University of North Carolina, so forth and so on. And I'm saying all this um, to say to you guys that, um, you know, a lot of times um, the terms um, diversity and inclusion within these mission statements at a lot of these institutions, like they're, they're used uh, interchangeably and loosely, you know? And I think, you know, we just have to be very careful about how we um, play into that as faculty, staff, and students, if that makes sense. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, we have to basically, first and foremost, become aware of our own implicit biases, um, come to terms with those. And when I walk you all through the PowerPoint, you'll see more of that. And basically, um, be willing to put in the work to really do diligent diversity and inclusion work. Because I think you know, if we if we stay, if we reside in our comfort zones and our comfort domiciles, um, it's just to repeat the cycle. So I guess I would like to begin by just you all just voicing, um, you know, to me, um, what does diversity and inclusion look like to you? Um, and what are some attributes of it that you feel will enhance American University, um, specifically um, um, with the departments that you all actually um, work in? Yeah, I can start off this conversation if that's okay with everyone. Um, my name's Chloe, I'm the EIC for AWOL. I am also only one of two editor-in-chiefs, I mean, e-board members of color and AWOL. Um, and I think in terms of what diversity and equity means at AU, it honestly means nothing to me because inclusion does not equate actually good reporting or writing to cover student media. Like I know even recently, the Eagle has its has a black EIC, but they hurt the black community in a lot of ways on campus and communities of color in a lot of ways. And we do that all the time too. Um, so I think like what would be helpful is trying to figure out guidelines and um, not punitive measures, but just establishing ways to hold people accountable for when they do mess up, um, because that's going to happen no matter what. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. All right. And, and, and you're absolutely right. Guidelines and um, I, I don't like to use the term um, disciplinary actions, but certainly guidelines. But even before we get to uh, the destination of guidelines, I think um, um, trainings, diligent trainings in regard to um, what inclusion and diversity means, right? Or diversity and inclusion, however, tomato, tomato. What, what it actually means um, specifically in the workplace. Um, could someone else weigh in on that question or just echo um, what was just stated? Um, if anyone else wants to say anything, um, I'll just go ahead. Um, I think one of our, um, her campus's main missions is to empower our writers and um, give them a platform for authentic expression. Um, and I think so that they are able to express topics and really anything that's passionate and important to them that they're passionate about or that's important to them. Um, so I think our main takeaway would be um, just being able to write about certain events properly and make these spaces inclusive for people so that they feel like their voices are heard. Um, I think that's what the inclusivity part means to me. It's what I try to do within my eboard and within my space um, with our writers and everything. So um, that's kind of what I see inclusivity as, is just making sure that everyone feels heard and has a platform to express themselves properly and in the ways that they want to. Um, yeah, that's what I have so far. Okay, okay. And you made some very valid points. All right, anyone else? Yeah, I'm just thinking like, sometimes I feel like we talk about diversity and inclusion in like you said, a loose way or like vague way. And sometimes I wish that like as 
a white person on campus and like a white reporter, I had more concrete steps to take to make my reporting and just like the way I interact with people on campus more like actually inclusive uh, rather than just like this abstract value. Very valid point. Okay. Um, if I could have maybe two or three more people weigh in, um, I think this open discussion can help. And they um, I agree with um, people some things. You know, I agree with whoever was just talking about how, like, a lot of times we talk about diversity and inclusion, but then, like, there are no steps for a follow through plan. Like, it's just like, this is we need to be more diverse and inclusive but then they never like give us like so this is how we're going to do it. this is how we're going to accomplish it through these steps and this is what we need you to do and like i feel like having a very like when our, when our school says it like they say it all the time but then they never like talk about what they're doing and how they're doing it so i think like how like as you said like as a white writer how is it like how should I use my platform to amplify POC voices and like their message and like POC owned businesses? Cause I think that would be like something really cool to write about during black history month. Like I think someone actually already wrote, wrote about it, but like black owned businesses that are like really cool and you should check out stuff like that. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, maybe two or three more folks before we, I, I actually uh, get into the PowerPoint and just try to walk you all through <clears throat> a few things I think that are important for this to even take place. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is just that as college media organizations were always every semester and during the semester always looking for recruitment. And I think one of the biggest things in her campus is we have a hard time drawing in people of color to get their point of views rather than always being told from a white person's perspective. So I don't know like what can be done about that. Cause again, like everyone said so far, the school doesn't always give you those guides to doing that and making sure that you're presenting a safe space because as our editor in chief said, Hannah, our platform is to give specifically women a voice. And we really do mean all women when we say that. So I would just like to hear more about that as well. Very valid point. Very valid point. Yeah. All right. Uh, someone else? No one want wants to weigh in? Um, I guess one thing that I think about and that I've talked about in some of my classes is kind of how like you were saying earlier that diversity inclusion as a term has kind of gotten basically like overused, especially by a lot of like predominantly white institutions that want to make it seem like they are addressing issues of racism or whatever may be on their campus. Um, when in reality, a lot of just the like structural facts of that institution are inherently racist or transphobic or Islamophobic or whatever it may be. And so I guess it's just kind of like as an individual within, in, within an institution that's like inherently built on these concepts, how much is there that you can do in a way? Yeah. And I'm sorry, who, um, who's, who's, I can't see anything. Who's, who, well, I can see you, um, just a few of you. Who was just speaking? That was me, Wyatt. Well, okay. So, so th that's, that's the rhetoric I'm looking for. That's why I was asking you all to, it's time in because I'm, I'm waiting. I was waiting for someone to actually highlight that. And I think, well, I don't think I know that's the starting point, right? We have to start with even, even before, well, we, 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 we begin with our own implicit biases, but you have to embrace the fact that these institutions, these PWIs, are specifically American, um, it's, it's built is built um, to embrace um, white culture. And a lot of times, um, 
what happens is it's perpetuated, right? That's perpetuated. And um, the campus culture takes on <clears throat> and it mimics that effect. So when you have students of color who, um, and, and faculty of color, <clears throat> because faculty are not, um, are not safe from this as well. But when, when you have this, this culture of whiteness, which creates this safe space of whiteness, um, it's almost like that culture is being protected by the big bad bully, right? <clears throat> and the big bad bully is the structure system of the university. And no one wants to relinquish their protection from the bully, if that's so, so to speak. And I, please forgive me if I'm way off, but I love to use a lot of analogies, especially sports. But I think that's just the reality of it. And here's the thing about implicit bias, bias well, uh, uh, inclusion, diversity, implicit bias, all this stuff. The thing is, if you feel it, it's happening. If you feel it is happening, it, it, it's no question. If you feel as if um, um, the atmosphere is not balanced, um, it's not. Trust me. Um, I've worked as a as a younger professor of color. I've worked in a lot in a number of universities, and I've and in in some cases, <laughs> in some cases, I've been the only professor of color in these in the right. Even now, with my department, American University. I'm the only male of color. There are a few women of color, but I'm the only male of color, right? Um, and here's another thing too, and I'm gonna use me, I'm gonna use this, uh, me as an example here. Every single semester <laughs> that I've, I've taught at a predominantly white institution, I've always had multiple students, white students tell me, you're the first black person or teacher, period, K-12 to college that I've ever had in my life, especially teaching English or literature. So I think, you know, when we, when, when we, when I hear things like that, well, I don't think I know, but when I hear these comments, it just, re, it just, it reinforces the truth. And the truth is, is that within these, these structures, um, these, these institutional structures, um, they're standing room only for um, um, counterparts or exterior races and not so much and I, I don't I don't I, you know there are times where we have to actually consider race but <laughs> a lot of time uh, diversity and inclusion is based upon culture right um, um, where we have this predominantly white culture <laughs> that's not interested in embracing any um, any exterior cultures so what do we do about that how do we um, even the playing field even with women in these predominantly white institutions where we have, it's a, it's a patriarchal um, sort of a patri white, white male, or white patriarchal, patriarchal um, dominated area. How do we give women a voice, women of color and white women in these institutions, right? So with that being said, I wanna, well, I'm sorry, does anyone have any questions about anything or any comments? You wanna make any comments? Okay. All right. So allow me to share my screen. I just want to walk you all through um, a few things that I think are important and will um, definitely spark some good conversation. Um, give me one. Oh, here we go. And when we meet next time, I'll go even further. Um, and what I mean by that is I'll, um, I have this material that actually focuses on media, <coughs> biases in media, racial biases in media, and some of the, <clears throat> some subtle, um, forms of, um, uh, discrimination when it comes to media that we Can you see my screen? No, yes. Yes, we can see yeah. it. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right, so again, <laughs> forgive, I'm sorry, forgive me. I am actually, uh, uh, all right, so this power, this, this is actually, uh, a really good 
PowerPoint, it basically focuses on implicit biases. Now, we can apply this to the classroom and we can also apply it within the professional workspace, right? And it, it, here's where we actually really have to honestly come to terms with our introductory environments and what we've been conditioned to believe about ourselves and about our exterior counterparts, right? Um, and, I, and I mentioned to you all, and that was my personal opinion, that um, inclusion and diversity within these institutions, when they place these, when they place these, um, these, these enactments in these mission statements, you know, a large portion of the time, it's just to say, hey, we did it. And I'm speaking, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from experiences, right? <clears throat> and I'm speaking from the faculty side. Now I have, I see it as well, um, you know, in terms of students, but I think at the end of the day, you all understand where I'm, I'm going with this. So what is implicit biases and what effect does it have in the classroom? Now we can actually, it's interchangeable. What effect does it have in the workplace as well, right? And this is just some background information of implicit biases. Now, again, and before we even begin, um, I want you all just to be thinking about your introductory environments, your bubble, right? The bubble that you um, were conditioned in, right? What was instilled in you as a child about exterior races, about your own race, about exterior cultures? These are all very important questions you you know because if you if you don't come to terms with these things you won't be able <clears throat> to challenge yourself to do better within the workplace or to just personally do better right so the term was first coined by psychologists um mazarin um Banaji, and tony greenwald right now implicit bias is also known as un unconscious bias right or implicit social cognition right now, here's, here's, here's where we challenge ourselves. We come to terms with, again, what we've been known. Well, I'm sorry, what we've been conditioned to think about exterior races. Because what we don't realize is, <coughs> excuse me, and on the next, the next time we meet, I'll highlight, I'll go more in depth about this, but even the mispronunciation of a name, right, can be considered um, a form of discrimination. You've been working with this person, and you know it's time to come time for it's time for you to present an award or or maybe to write an um write a piece about them or um or you know a segment about them and you miss you, you misspell the name or mispronounce the name that's a form of discrimination um and again we'll talk more about that um so implicit bias is also unknown also known as unconscious bias or implicit social cognition right the term refers to unconscious attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions and decisions about other people, right? Especially when it comes to race and culture. So two words, assumptions and expectations, right? Assumptions and expectations. Um, I'll come back to that. So the problem with implicit biases, right? It, it excludes students or faculty, faculty members or coworkers. Um, it may silence marginalized groups who are already silenced, prevent students from developing their potential. Now, I, excuse me, not to jump ahead, but I do want to highlight this. Um, the next time we meet, I'll show you all a piece that was written um, by Yahoo News. Um, does, do you all, well, I think we're all old enough to remember, we all were younger, but you all remember Hurricane Katrina that devastated New Orleans, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. There was a piece written. Um, there was a piece written as, um, you know, New Orleans was being um, devastated. Yahoo News wrote this piece, and again, I'll share this with you. I just, I just want to highlight this, right? Since we, since we, you know, you all are writers, and this is, this is, right. Um, on your plateau. So they wrote a piece about <clears throat> the devastation. And then um, right after they um, the article highlights the devastation, it has two separate images. It has 
on the left side, an image of a white male and white female wading through um, chest high waters with, with bags, <clears throat> right? You can see the bags on top of the water that they're actually, you know, pulling. And then on the right side, there's a black young man, black boy, um, facing the same conditions in water um, with a bag um, in his hand. But, you know, two images, split image. Long story short, the caption for the white couple basically says that, um, and here's what we have to, and, and, I, I'm, I'm, I, and I'm sure you all have been trained in terms of writing professionally, you know, professional, whatever, it doesn't really matter, but, you know, you, <coughs> you have to be very careful about being, you know, when, you, when you're descriptive and, and the verbs you use and adjectives and things like that you use. But anyway, the white couple, um, the caption basically stated that the white couple um, was wading through uh, chest deep waters after finding groceries. And for the black boy, it says that um, it said something like um, male walking through water after looting groceries from a grocery store, right? Same conditions, <clears throat> probably the same, you know, I'm thinking the same, pro same locality. But my point is, m my question when I read that article, right, my question is, how did that escape and how was it not filtered? Because I'm almost certain it went through um, a few stages of editing, levels of editing. At what point did it, did it get through to be published to the world? And, <laughs> me, and that's, part of the, that's part of the implicit bias in the media, media problem where the media um, um, paints um, certain cultures and groups of folks as these barbaric, 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 barbaric people, right? So that's just an example. And I'll give you all a tangible, I'll, I'll show that to you um, the next time we meet. I'll actually show that clip to you, uh, whatever the case may be. So here's, here's where, I, again, to, 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 to even focus on diversity and, and inclusion and to even want to come to terms with possible solutions, we have to come to terms with our own implicit biases, okay? Um, because implicit biases are pervasive. We all have them. Every single person um, on the Zoom call, we all have them, right? Everyone has them. Um, even people with uh, um, avowed commitments to, uh, to impartiality, for example, judges, right? Doctors, right? And we can go on and on and, you know, we can, we can actually too, and we can statistically um, align biases with healthcare deficiencies. And <coughs> we can go, we can, <coughs> excuse me, go even further where we can focus on um, um, zip codes where, your, you know, the level, of quality education depends on your zip code and healthcare depends on your zip code. Implicit and explicit biases are related, but distinct, uh, but distinct mental constructs. Watch this. They are not mutually exclusive and may even reinforce each other, right? The, uh, uh, the implicit associations we hold do not necessarily align with our, with our declared beliefs or even reflect the stances we would explicitly endorse. For example, we may endorse gender equality but our actions may show otherwise. For example, someone in the workspace may endorse <coughs> women having a voice, but their actions don't show that they are for that. But that goes back to what they've been taught about women having a voice in their introductory worlds, which is aligned with implicit biases, if that makes sense. So we generally tend to hold implicit biases that favor our own in-group. This is basically the foundation of everything I want you all to take away tonight. What do we really believe in? What do we truly, what have we been conditioned to believe in based upon our culture and our race? Our end group. And all this aligns with our social identity, right? Though research has shown that we can still hold implicit biases against our in-group, all right? A few more slides here. Implicit biases are malleable, right? Um, the implicit associations that we have formed can be gradually unlearned through a variety of uh, 
D, bias, and techniques. Now, here's where we can actually begin to work on these things. And I, and again, <laughs> me personally, I believe before we even begin to throw things at the wall to see what sticks in terms of solutions, we have to come to terms with our own implicit biases. We have to. So what does this look like in the classroom and what does this look like in the workplace? So as an instructor, um, instructors may assume that certain students um, know to seek help when they're struggling. All those students are uh, um, at higher risk for struggling academically, are, are often uh, less likely to seek help and support. <clears throat> instructors may assume that students from certain backgrounds or social groups have different intellectual abilities. But guess what? This also applies in the professional world. It does. I've been on hiring committees. I learned so much. A few years, a few years ago, I was actually um, on a hiring committee here in the States at a university. I won't name the university's name. And it's funny because I placed, I placed that experience against the backdrop of me being on a hiring committee when I was lecturing in, in China. There was, I couldn't find an ounce of bias. When I was in Asia, it was more so the best player hits the floor. If you can play, you play. So we can actually, again, we can, we can translate this to the professional world. Instructors may inspect students who speak with certain accents to be poor writers or dialects or slangs, right? Students with substandard writing abilities may be stereotyped as lacking intellectual ability. And this is without having any type of experience with the student or coworker. Instructors might treat students uh, with physical disabilities as if they uh, may also have mental disabilities and thus require more attention. Students who are affiliated with a particular identity group may be treated as experts on issues related to that group. Think about it. The strength of your social circles, the strength of your parents' social circles, the strength of the magnet school, <clears throat> or a private school you, you a person could, could have gone to, right? Instructors may also um, assume the students will be uh, best uh, relate to the historical contemporary or fictional character who resembles them demographically. If as a professional, someone resembles you or, your, or they align with your culture, you may show more favoritism. You may be more likely to speak to them at, <coughs> at a luncheon you may be more likely, you may be drawn closer to them um, in terms of um, um, communicating um, or deciding on wh which table you want to actually um, sit in for the, for the rest of the night. All these things play a part. So, I know this is kind of small, I'm sorry, but self-assessing, right? Implicit biases. So, um, we can review these examples that I just mentioned and self-reflect. But we want to make sure <clears throat> that we diligently, um, we diligently step outside of our bubbles and we examine our introductory environments and we come to terms with the implicit biases that we have, right? And this is not to have sympathy, but this is just basically to condition your mind, to yourselves um, to be open and honest and, 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 and part of the honesty, part of becoming honest with yourself is being able to have a tolerance for the conversations that need to be had in this country about race relations. We have to, we have to have build a tolerance for these conversations. And it's not about pointing fingers. <clears throat> I think these conversations are not about pointing fingers. These conversations should be had to enlighten everyone because whether we want to accept it or not, <clears throat> everyone plays a role. You either benefit from racism or you lose. It's, it's no in between. And I think we need to do a better job of having these, these diligent conversations, right? Effective conversations so that we can understand how everyone's being affected, which carries over to diversity and inclusion, right? All right, so, um, how do we raise awareness? What can we do on the job and in the classroom to raise awareness? Um, a, obviously, come in terms with come to terms with our own implicit biases, right? Um, 
we can develop an inclusive work environment, uh, classroom climate, um, writing practices, right? We can solicit feedback from outside observers, right? Have someone to come in or just have someone <clears throat> to shadow us um, or just set up um, peer, um, maybe some groups that meet periodically to share the experiences, maybe maybe every 30 days or every, every other month or whatever, um, you know, get together and meet and share experiences, right? Um, or if you are teaching, I know I have, I may have some professors here or teachers here or instructors here, um, solicit feedback, right? Candid feedback from the folks you work with or and, and students. And you can use this feedback um, to help you assess whether their your unconscious biases are still manifesting. Um, because it's just it's just like when we perspire, right? It just it, we can't stop it. If we when we get too hot, it just ha it, it will. It's, excrete through our skin. We, you just can't stop it. You can't, you can't suppress biases. They come out. And, and, I, and the example I like to use is, again, we can just shadow statistics. <clears throat> if we shadow statistics in the health field, education field, right, you can, you can actually trail um, implicit biases. Now, <laughs> and what I mean by that, let me give a, let me give you another example. Back in 2010, I did some research. I was writing this book, and I and I wanted to focus on prison statistics. Now, um, I did some diligent research on um, prisons in America, and um, I even broke it broke. Well, I was able to dissect the research down to certain crimes and who committed these crimes um, in terms of culture and races. And then I went a little further, and I found out. I was able to find uh, the sentencing guidelines and how much um, prison time or jail time or home confinement that you know each <clears throat> person from these different races got, but even though they committed the same crime. Long story short, I stumbled upon these two PhDs, and their research suggested that I think it was 2011. I can't remember 20. I think it was 2011. Anyway, 2010, 2011, and their research suggested that. Men of color, just men of color in America, just men of color in America, um, during that time, when their prison sentences were um, um, added up all together, when they, you know, if you were to, if when they, when they basically collectively um, meshed their time, prison sentences, home confinement, state time, fed time, it actually equaled, it ended up equaling, just in America, it. Uh, it ended up equaling 16 million years worth of jail time. 16 million years. And I can, and, you know, and I don't, I mean, I'm not here just to, you know, <laughs> go further with that, but I, I can't, I can say if we, even if we statistically broke it down that year and we did a head count on the, um, the percentage, percentage of Americans that men of color made up was very small. But my point is, how do we get to that point to where you have men of color in America serving 16 million years worth of time. We have to go back and we have to um, explore <clears throat> implicit biases because that affects the guidelines. And I know this for a fact, I have a friend of mine, she, we, she actually used to teach at a college with me in North Carolina. She's actually a judge now. She was an um, um, attorney at the time, um, but she's actually a full-time judge now in Durham, North Carolina. And we actually have these conversations all the time. So hopefully, um, what I just said made some sort of sense. Um, I want to come back to you all now and just hear anything you have to say. Um, and, you know, I think, again, an American, I think American University is a great place. I know for me, it's been a great place to work at this point. Um, my students have been awesome, but I do believe um, American University has a lot of work to do when it comes to diversity and inclusion. And this is on, um, on at, at all levels of American University. Um, Numbers don't lie. Um, and I think at the end of the day, the atmosphere at American um, is a clear indication that um, just some, some, you know, something is just, just not right. Um, so um, there's a class, I think it's AUX. Am, am I saying that correctly? Um, does AUX focus remotely on 
inclusion, implicit biases, race, anything like that? Yeah, is it the whole second semester is about okay. that. Okay, is it, do you feel like, is it effective, you think? Um, when I did it, it, I think it greatly depends on who you have as an instructor. Um, sorry. Um, I think it depends on who you have as an instructor. And sadly, a lot of the time, it's the faculty of color in the program who can actually teach um, the topics, whereas other people have had very negative experience with white instructors. Um, but again, the labor is very unequal in the department. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And Chloe, um, Chloe, right? Chloe, that's my point. That's, that's my point. When we, when, when <laughs> the faculty, when you look at the diversity of students at American, it's not matched by faculty, right? And, you know, as a professor, you know, we never say, well, such and such, um, doesn't is not effective, whatever, because you know that's just not what we do. But I will say this: I will, and I stand on this. I stand firmly on this. When it comes to race relations or inclusion and diversity, you you know the conversation is different when it comes from how counter counterpart racism. In my experience, is even on faculty meetings. I have faculty members who are who are white, obviously, and they are passionate about wanting to lend the hand to the weight that we that we haul as, as people of color, right? But that conversation still comes from a place of comfortability, right? It doesn't come from urgency. When I talk about racism, it comes from urgency because I see and I can explain and I can articulate the ongoing damage that it's doing psychologically, emotionally, financially, and I can go on and on and on. Um, but anyway, um, yeah. There's a lot that there's a lot to be discussed when it comes to this. So any any questions, any any comments about anything? Um any questions about anything this morning? I would love to hear some personal experiences. Um some of you shared some of your experiences, but um I would love to hear like a personal experience um um that you that you've recently had um in terms of um inclusion, diversity, um um, race relations um, that you feel that you felt at that time um, something needed to be addressed. Anyone have any personal stories or just want to, you know, share anything, um, experiences? I know I was in AUX like less than a half hour ago and um, it turned into, you know, a kind of a conversation we were talking about history and the need for marginalized communities to be included in the history of that we're like learning in American public schools and um, one student, you know, completely turned that into as, you know, that doesn't need to be something that's taught that's not accurate history and it turned into like victimizing a lot of people in the classroom environment and like yes the professor tried to do a little bit to kind of like stop that but like still kind of claiming their ideas were valid but at the same time like while those ideas may be their ideas like it still victimizes a lot of people at the same time. So like kind of holding that balance of one can have their own opinions, but also like you need to be mindful of those with marginalized identities in the room while having those conversations. Certainly. And there is a fine line, I think, when it comes to, when it comes to you know, having a healthy discussion. I, think, I know for me, um, I just, I highlight the fact that, you know, we all, this is something we all can benefit from. Right. And it's not about, you know, it's not about having a conversation just for the sake of having it. Like those are games I don't play. I really don't because, you know, things like diversity and inclusion and racism, like these things are in some cases for people of color, these are life or death situations. I've seen people not be able to get jobs based upon certain things. I'll leave it at that. Right. Or certain people's livelihoods have been um, demised, right. Based upon, diversity and inclusion um, types of issues. Like the, the, this is not, this is a life or death situation. It really is. So, you know, so how do we have this healthy conversation? A, you know, <clears throat> you make it welcoming. You, you know, I know for me, I just, I, I like to extend an open invitation to healthy conversation. No one's pointing fingers. When you point one finger, three are pointing back at you. That's just an old school philosophy my mom used to tell me, right? It's not a blame game. It's a, 
let's 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 come to the table. Um, everyone has a seat at this particular table and have this healthy discussion because, you know, with that and not coming to terms with our own implicit biases, it's it's just going to be a dog chasing its tail. And let's keep let's keep it real too. Let's just be honest. A lot of folks in higher administrative play, um, positions at these institutions, they don't give a damn about diversity and inclusion. They don't. It 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 so. At some point, we have to take it upon ourselves to say, hey, you know what, let me at least try to figure this thing out because I'm not going to be a college student forever. I'm not going to work here forever. We need to apply these, these same <clears throat> rules and regulations beyond the classroom and life, right? As a person of color, we need to have this conversation so we can get a better understanding of where folks are. You know, everyone doesn't mean well, doesn't mean harm to people of color. You know, they don't. Um, but it's always good to have a diligent and um, effective understanding of, 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 of why people respond to certain things, you know, and a lot of it has to do with fear. You know, we fear what we don't understand. Um, but again, I, and I, and I say this, and you probably gonna hear me say this a, a, a thousand more times, you know, standing on and deciding to come to terms with our own implicit biases for me, that's ground zero. That's the grassroots movement. That's where we begin. Um, just being open and honest about what, what has been instilled in us um, as adolescents about other groups, the cultures, right? Um, and then we can actually de, like, we can like decode some of those myths as when we step, when we diligently step outside of our bubbles, right? So, Hannah, do you have any? comments or questions or um i don't have anything um but did uh awol did y'all have something that you wanted to um mention yeah um briefly or not briefly but i just wanted to like emphasize that for a lot of our white staffers i don't want this to be an excuse for y'all um and even for you know non-white staffers who also have their own implicit biases in other ways um, I don't want this to serve as an excuse um, to not further reflect on your own reporting and actions and how that has a bunch of racism in it always, um, because we are at American University and while it is a great place to be, it's very rooted in whiteness um, from our very founding and even from our very founding of our individual orgs. Um, so that's all I wanted to say in terms of that, just making sure that this isn't a one-time thing of us being like, oh, we did this training um, and had, went into this Zoom meeting, and so we are free of implicit biases. And, and, and Chloe, you know what? I actually, I, I would love to echo that thought because, again, I think what you just said Basically, I don't really have anything else to say. You just hit the nail, the nail on the head. But no, um, um, you said it. I was going to say this for the, the next time we meet, I'm going to go further in depth in terms of how media, how these things come out in media. But you just said it. We have to come to terms with the fact that just like this country, <clears throat> which is another conversation, has been rooted in white male patriarchal power. It's been perpetuated. And the same thing at American University. That's why I just mentioned <laughs> even when I'm in my faculty meetings, when we're talking about race relations or inclusion and diversity, when it, when it's coming from white faculty, it's coming from a place of that protection of that um, a place of comfortability, that white space where, to me, we just can't have a conversation about race while you're comfortable, right? I need you. I need you to come into my world and 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 hear what I have to say because I'm actually reporting to you live from where the, the, uh, the um, uh, uh, inclusion is not happening and the diversity is not happening. So those are the types of conversations we have to be willing to, we have to be willing to listen is what I'm saying, right? Um, and and um, because it's not a debate, <laughs> it's not a debate when we talk about inclusion and diversity, it's not a debate at all. It's, it's an open form um, and it's informative. And I think white students, white faculty, have to be willing to honestly um, come to terms with the fact that it's okay <clears throat> to have the discussion and it's okay to be educated on the white culture and what perpetuates it um, and how damaging it is, 
how damaging it, it is psychologically and emotionally to um, students of color and faculty of color, right? So, um, yeah, you all make some good points, some very valid points. And I hear, beyond your words, I hear frustration. <clears throat> I hear um, fatigue. Because guess what? I'm, 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 the same, I'm the same way. You know, just because I'm on the other side, I'm a professor, doesn't mean I'm not experiencing it, or I don't smell it, or I don't see it, or I don't visualize it. And that's probably why I write about it so diligently and so aggressively because I'm tired of writing about the same thing James Baldwin wrote about in 1963. I'm tired of writing about the same thing Bill Hooks wrote about. I'm writing about the same thing that Ellis Coase is writing about. It's 2021 and I'm still writing about people of color having equity, not necessarily equality, but equity in America. I'm still writing about how your zip code determines the quality of healthcare you have and if you can get a housing loan, excuse me, or if uh, your education will be of quality. Something's not right. If I'm still writing about this in 2021, something's not right. And I think we all know it's, it's, it's right here. We all know. Let's keep it real. We know, we know what's not happening. So implicit biases, come to terms with that. Explore your introductory environments diligently and honestly. Go back and reflect on how you were raised. What were you taught about exterior cultures? Good or bad, right? And then we meet again when we come back. Let's go through um the information that I have and it's going to focus more so on writers on media right and how media um helps to perpetuate the culture in at American University media does that I think we'll have a better understanding how it actually relates more so to you all professionally if that makes sense and then we can have a even more broad discussion about inclusion and diversity Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to start the conversation and open up the conversation with us. And um, we're really looking forward to uh, meeting with you again. Likewise. Does anyone yes, have anything else? Okay, cool. <laughs> um, did you have anything else? No, no, I just want to say, um, yeah, just uh, we can communicate or Chloe, we can communicate. Let me know when you all are ready to do this, do part two. Um, part two, I will say, I would love for us to have more discussion, all right? Everyone to kind of chime in and weigh in. Um, yeah, let me know whenever you guys are ready, I'm ready, and you guys are super awesome. I just wanted to tell you that. So. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming and uh, being open to discussion. Um, we will let y'all know um, as soon as we talk about um, our next session. So awesome. Have a great night, everyone. Have a great night. Thank everyone. you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.